toward the end of our study of Luke's gospel. Has this been a good study for people? I've, I've really um, got a lot out of it uh, myself, seen things in Luke that I hadn't seen before and uh, enjoy studying it with you and sorry that I didn't turn off my phone. Um, Next week, remember, is Easter. We will not have Bible study. So no Bible study next week. And then the following two weeks will be our, I imagine, our last ones on Luke. We have three more chapters after today, 22, 23, 24, and they deal with the passion story. So the Last Supper, the arrest of Jesus, his trial, his crucifixion, the resurrection, post-resurrection views, all of this is now what we'll be looking at starting the week after Easter. So having celebrated Easter, we'll now look at the story about it in, in Luke. For today, uh, Tessa took us up through a good part of chapter 20 last time, and I want to pick up with one story in chapter 20 and then look at chapter 21 today. Let me give one word of backdrop, uh, drop, uh, background before we begin. It's been really striking to me to see how what we call theocentric Luke's gospel is. That is, everything is focused on God. Everything that happens through Jesus, he attributes immediately to God which is the reason for all of the prayer that we talked about. He's constantly praying to God and lifting up whatever is happening for um, God's blessing. I stress this because I was at a meeting this on uh, Zoom this last week in which one of the Catholic participants talked about the Jesus tree of the Protestants. Oh. That is, we focus so much on Jesus and not on the fullness of God in which, which was incarnate in Jesus. And um, so they would say, God is creator, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not simply the focus on Jesus. Well, that's Luke. Luke constantly is pointing back toward God, so that what Jesus proclaims is the kingdom of God. He doesn't call for anyone to proclaim him. That's what the later descendants did of Christians, but not Luke. For Luke, the focus on Jesus always then points beyond Jesus to God, who is incarnate in Jesus, who is the, the, the Messiah uh, in Luke's view. But I think it's important to get that straight. The other thing is about this kingdom that he proclaims, because we'll see this today, is that this kingdom is among us, but it also at some future time will come in its fullness. So it was inaugurated in Jesus, he proclaimed it. It will come in its fullness later, and we live in between. Luke's very clear about where we live in this time in between, with a real responsibility to proclaim what Jesus proclaimed, and always pointing toward God. So hold that in mind as we look at uh, three different passages today. So let's start with chapter 20, verses 20 through 26. And um, um, Grace, would you read that for us? Chapter 20, verses 20 through 26. Okay. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something, he said, so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius whose portrait and inscription are on it. 
Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. They were unable to trap him in what he said there in public and astonished by his answer, they became silent. Thanks. Thanks. Beautiful. Um, you see the dilemma, by the way. Let me just name the dilemma. And then I'm interested in hearing how you hear it and respond to his answer. <clears throat> but the dilemma they're putting to him is that if it is law, if he says it is lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, then he runs afoul of the zealots who are against anything that's Roman. Uh, maybe in today's terms, you would say that he's um, uh, uh, going to run afoul of his base. Uh, so there are all these Jews who think that the Romans are simply unlawful occupiers. And so if he says it's lawful to pay taxes, he runs afoul of them. If he says it's unlawful, then he's guilty of treason against the Romans. That's what they're trying to get him to say because they're wanting to trap him. You follow the dilemma that he's in. That's what they're trying to put him in this kind of a situation. How do you, uh, how do you read his answer? How do you like his answer? Well, since we are made in the image of God, then we are giving ourselves to God while the money is irrelevant, which we've seen in a number of other parables as well, um, such as, you know, consider the lilies of the field. Yeah, yeah. It, this is a really important point to, to point out, is that the image of Caesar is on the coin, but the image of God is on us. So in some sense, they're being played off against one another, as uh, Kathy's pointing out. Uh, you give to that where the image is. How about others? What do you see in this? Yeah, Tim? Well, I used to see this as, um, okay, government's okay and over here, and God's kingdom is okay, obviously, and over here. But the hearers, it seems to me, would have remembered a passage that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Therefore, nothing belonged to Caesar. Um, and, and he said that without saying it because his listeners, his hearers would know that scripture and remember it. So I see it now more as a, a rejection of, of Caesar and any power that he um, suggests that he might have. Nice, interesting. Beth? Well, first of all, you know, my first reaction is great storytelling on Luke. Number two, because there's, you know, all the tension and, right. and uh, they're out to get him already. And so this is building up to right. what's gonna happen next. But um, also just right there, just a few lines, what Jesus is, uh, intelligent, educated, raised in Talmud. He knows what these people, you know, he knows people, right? Mm -hmm. He knows his people are, do not have a pure agenda when they're coming and saying, teacher, you know, tell us what's right and what's wrong. They have an agenda that is not, you know, good for him or his followers necessarily. He, he, he susses that out right away. Yeah, yeah, good, good. What about others? <clears throat> yeah, Marcia. And I also think that um, it shows what's um, of value here. If Caesar, if the government puts so much value on Caesar getting his money, then, you know, that's a small thing give him his little bit of chump change and let him go about his way. But God owns all of it. And, and obviously God is, has the greater value here, having been creator. And have, I mean, when you look at a few denarius compared to the whole creation, what's of greater value? Nice, nice. These are great. 
I love these answers and uh, and I love the way you're putting them in tension with one another as Tim did sort of I think this and then think this Mariana. I think it also uh, reminds us uh, not just those tricksters <clears throat> that tried to trick Jesus and trap him, but to remind us again of where where our value needs to be, yes. not to be sucked in by money or the power or or who has the power over us in our own time. Mm -hmm. I think it's very applicable to now. Um, and we were in the audience, we get to hear the, we get to hear Jesus brilliant. What a, what a fine attorney, <laughs> you know, what a fine spokesperson he is before um, the powers that think they are. Good, good. I think it's also important to see, though, the, no, I don't know, though is the right word here. I think it's important for us to see that Christian faith doesn't take us out of the world. Yeah. We still live in the world. The, yeah. We're not simply removed to some spiritual uh, realm. Um, uh, this argues, in my mind, against uh, some groups like the Amish who think that in Christian faith we kind of retreat to a separate sphere on our own. That's not what Luke thinks. I mean, there are arguments in Scripture for that, but that's not Luke. Luke says we're living right in the midst of the world, and you'll see it all the way through the book of Acts, where Paul also is interacting with uh, civil authorities all the time. Luke knows that Jesus isn't returning immediately. And so we live in the world, and I think he's saying it does not violate our Christian faith to pay taxes. I think. Now, I'm going to argue the other side in a minute. Tessa? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at this and thinking in that same way as you're in this world, and so pick your battles wisely. Like, which things are you going to fight against? You know, are you going to fight against paying taxes? Is that the one thing that you're going to bet all your money on, literally, and um, try to fight against? Or is that something that you just do and it's part of your life and you continue and you know that that's what you give, but the rest of your life, right, and everything else, you give what is necessary to God? I don't know. That's kind of what I think, especially as Christians, we want to pick every single battle, but not every single battle is worth fighting for. Um, mm -hmm. Your comments, by the way, around the, all the ones that you've just offered are the equal of anything I would hear in a seminary class. I mean, these are very fine comments where you're pointing out various dimensions of this story. I mean, Jesus, after all, doesn't counsel rebellion here. He doesn't say, all right, don't pay taxes. That's all wrong. On the other hand, as you've pointed out, the kingdom of God in Jesus is the alternative to the kingdom of Caesar. And we see that in Luke all the way from the very beginning. Remember in the birth story, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. And so they go down and give birth to this baby who is seen right from the beginning as the alternative to Caesar Augustus. So, so you've got a, a real tension all the way. Um, uh, that's why, to be honest, they executed him. <laughs> Look at, look at chapter 23 for just a second, the first three verses. Then the assembly rose as a body and, and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You say so. It's a political charge that he's accused of being seen himself as an alternative. And they accuse him, of course, of saying, don't pay taxes when that's not what he actually said. What I liked, uh, very much appreciated uh, Tim's point also about seeing it this way and this way. It's possible to read this to say, there's a part of the world which is Caesar's and there's a part of the world which is God's. I think that's a mistake. All of the world is God's. How do we put it in right proportion within that is part of what's at stake here. Cheryl, you were going to say a minute ago and I cut you off. No, I was 
going to cut you off if you had called on me. So that, that's that's more important. I was just, you know, at that point I was saying, you know, just in a very worldly sense, this is tactically brilliant. It, it really is. There's nothing actionable in what he says, even if anybody does see through his real meaning. He can't be, he, his exact words could not be, if reliably reported, could not be used against him in any way. And it's not time yet. You know, it's not time yet. We, we've run against this a couple of times in the scripture. It's not time yet because if it were the, the time and if it were the moment, he could have delivered himself into their hands right then. And he would know how to do that, of course. The other thing that comes up is the whole idea of images and idols, which is, you know, our, our easy following after and, and all the pressure that there is to follow after um, the images and idols and, and that that is, um, Apart from being warned against in the Ten Commandments, that's another thing that I see pointed to here. Nice. Very nice. Let me uh, keep in mind also, you know that, the, uh, that Luke wrote not only the Gospel, but also the Book of Acts. So we have to keep in mind other things that are written by Luke. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 5. This is a passage we studied together. When they had brought them, that's Peter and the other apostles, they had them stand before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, that is the name of Jesus. But here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. So uh, I, I like the move that uh, Tim was talking about in his own life. Uh, finally, the bottom line is that all life is God's. And if there is a conflict, God must be served. But in the meantime, and it may not be time, you can pay taxes. Now, how does all of this um, inform our recent discussion about having a flag on the chancel. Yeah, I have to think about it too. Tim? Well, I've lived uh, all my life with the flag and the chancel, um, but it's always felt somewhat idolatrous to me uh, as did the Christian flag, because the, the central focus of our faith is neither flag, but broken bread, broken body, um, and, and get distracted by, by either one of those, either the corporate community or um, the uh, political community, um, we, we lose ourselves. Is it appropriate to recognize the community, the national community in which we live somewhere in the church? It is for me. Um, uh, I, I never hesitated, for example, um, on uh, the Veterans Day weekend to ask all of those who had, who had or were serving in the military to stand and be recognized because um, in their mind, and even somewhat in mine, they were um, um, they were they were protecting. They were providing protection um, for me, my children, etc. Um, I also had no problem on Memorial Day weekend in having a moment of silence um, to remember those in our families and our loved ones who had died, um, uh, but those, those were more temporary moments, whereas the flag, it's every week, it's in my face, I'm, a, I'm an American Christian. This, um, it, it seems to me that our answer in some ways um, reflects Luke here, 
That is, uh, it's not inappropriate for us to recognize that we live in a political entity, the United States, and to have that recognition somewhere in the church, but don't confuse it with God. I mean, something like that is what I think we were wrestling with. How do we say what is really prominent in our worship is God, but you can pay taxes because you live in a, in a state? Kathy? I, I would, if we're going to have a U.S. flag, I would want some kind of recognition of a, the world as a whole, because I, I get really tired of people who seem to think this country is all that matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it has to be made in the USA because apparently people in other countries don't deserve jobs. Um, you know, just that kind of thing. So that, that, that's been part of our discussion too. have a good world flag, mm -hmm. but at least, I don't know, the UN flag or something. <laughs> We've had this uh, discussion too. I'm not going to prolong it now, but I think all of this is very important part of our conversation. We live in the world. Luke's very aware of this. We live in a world that also taxes people. Luke's aware of this. We live in a world that even has a census. He knows this from the birth of Jesus. At the same time, we live in a world that is God's. And that's where we all, all live in allegiance. Luke, I think it's a wonderful story. And it's one that really deserves to be wrestled with. Let's take another story. If you would look at uh, chapter 20, verse 45 through 21.4. So 45 through 21.4. And the reason I start this way is just also to remind us uh, that in the Greek, there were no chapter breaks. <laughs> uh, we've imposed those artificially. And so the one story here sets up the second story, but because of the break in the chapter, we really don't see it. So, um, uh, Jennifer, do you have that there? Would you read that? Yes. He said to them, then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Uh, verse that 45. Right? Oh, 45. Mm -hmm. 45 way? through 21, 4. All Sorry. right. Sorry. In the hearing of all the people, he said to the disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Through 21.4, please. Through 20, okay, that works. He looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Thanks. Um, in the temple, I wish uh, we had a board here now. I'm sorry, I don't, don't have one to draw on. But you remember there was the Holy of Holies, a kind of inner, and then there was a courtyard that for the priests. And then there was an outer courtyard where all of the Jews could come. And in this outer courtyard, which is where the money changers temples, uh, tables that Jesus overturned, all of that was located. There were 13, we know this from records, 13 big boxes that had a trumpet like um, top to them. So you put in money and it went down uh, through this trumpet into the box. That's what she's putting money into. The coin was called a lepton, and it was worth about two cents. So she puts about four cents into one of these trumpet-like tubes that goes down into the box. What do you take from this? And notice how the stories, I mean, how it continues. So just as they devour widows' houses. He looks up and sees the widow. You can hear Luke making the connection between the stories. Uh, that's always been a concern that I've had. With, I've had fellow 
bosses that have come to me and said they were Christian and I've had more trouble. My feelings on being a Christian is your actions speak louder than your words. Uh, and you can see it in their heart. I mean, I've had good bosses and, you know, employees and stuff like that. But with the ones that come out and say that they're Christian right off the bat, scare the hell out of me. <laughs> That's just me. Thanks. Thanks for that witness. <laughs> good, good. I will tell you that some commentators see this as an attack on the temple system. Look at how they exploit the poor by they milk the widows of all the last of their money, like TV evangelists who are asking for money from people who don't have it to give to them. I'm not at all sure that's what's going on here, but it's possible because it starts with this account of how the widows are taken advantage of by the powers that be. So that's one way of reading this story. I think I've always read it as a contrast between those who give out of their poverty and those who give out of their abundance and what it has to say to us about that. When you hear a story like this, do you, does it weigh on your heart? Does it make you think about your own giving? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how we respond to a text like this one. Mary Jane, you're nodding. I want to hear what you, what you have to say. Um, it really does make me think um, about that. And as a child, I think I thought that um, it was all about being perfect and being the big gift, you know, the more you give, the more God's going to love you. And I think in this case, it feels very hierarchical and the widow is clearly near the bottom of the social structure. And these other guys seem to think that, um, that they're just fabulous because of all the money they can give. <laughs> and I think he's really speaking out against that kind of hierarchical thing. I think that, you know, the whole, the phrase that has become common in the last, I don't know, five years, we're all in this together. And it's much more um, a whole human family um, than, than this structure that the, the temple system seems to reflect. Nice. Do you think that what we put in that uh, box in some sense is more than just money as well? <laughs> I, this, this is what we also to think about. Um, I know, yes. It's, it reminds me of that scripture um, where your heart is. I, I can't quote it quickly where your money is there will your heart be yes, also yes yes that's the one um and it, it really speaks to what's important to you um and you know where your values are i'm not sure but what the stories we're reading these, these two stories um their proximity to one another isn't <clears throat> accidental because as with caesar god really demands all so here God demands all, and um, uh, that maybe demands is the wrong word, deserves. Um, the, and so she's giving all she has. That's what he's commended. Yeah, yeah, Betty? I just, uh, kind of an observation. I think if this day and age, uh, uh, I'm not a challenge. I guess we just have to pray about a lot. But there are so many, many, many Christian organizations and missionary groups, and so many Christian groups are. And I think, okay, I give you know a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit more here, and it's all I can do is pray about which ones I should be giving to because there are so, so many places that I'd like to give to, but money doesn't go that far. So does anybody have any special recommendations of uh, what we should consider when we are giving? I mean, we give directly to the church, but I have a whole list of groups beyond the church that I give to. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think the point is a great one that it's so complex in our time. And the danger is, is thinking that we can allow, we can sit back and allow others to take care of it. So I love your question about how do we support. Uh, I, I don't have any recommendation. I'm not sure I want to do that right now about which ones to support, except to say that, um, well, I, I, maybe others have on that, but sh first Cheryl and then Tim. I, this was before recommendations for therapies. Yeah. I mean, one of two things about the story for me. First, you know, is that it certainly illustrates what axiologists will call that difference between actual values and proclaimed values. So, you know, the, the proclaimed values have to do with let me make a big show of this and that and the other thing. And, you know, like I will say, oh, you know, the children are the most important thing to us, but then we don't put all of our resources towards taking care of the children, for example. But it's kind of an illustration of that. For me personally, it's one of those things that um, always comes into my mind when I think about, am I going to you know, push myself a little bit more if finances feel strained? Am I going to push myself a little bit more when I don't feel like I have any energy left to do something that I think is, is you know, right or good to do? And, you know, it's not like I don't feel like that sometimes. But. I, I, I find myself indicted by this. I give out of my abundance. And it's, I feel it much. Tim? Well, I'm, I was going to try to address please Eddie's comment or question from, um, from my own personal choices. Um, up until the last four years, um, I, I, I basically didn't um, make political contributions or uh, contributions to things like the Southern Poverty Law Center, which tries to address racism, et cetera. I tried to focus on faith-based uh, um, um, entities, primarily out of my own church, um, Week of Compassion, Reconciliation, um, those kinds of things. And when I would be called by the firefighters, for example, or the police union or whatever, I would say to them, you know, I am really grateful for your protection of me and my family. But I feel that there are a lot of non-Christians or non-contributors to faith-based that will make your budget, but I'm not sure that they would help me make the budget of my church or um, week of compassion or whatever. So that's, that's how I try to separate it. Nice, nice. We also know, of course, uh, personally, some of these folks within the church, and I trust them and, and the use of our money. So for what it's worth. I want to look at one other story. So I'm going to move on. So we stop in time. <clears throat> Tessa knows, the <clears throat> excuse me, Tessa knows the, the difficulty of getting through all the material as well we've talked about. Um, the last one I want to look at is this difficult um, question about the end of the world, and chapter 21 deals with it. So turn to chapter 21 again, or where we are. In the Bible, you have different perspectives about whether history will end and how it will end. So let me say a word about this tension to begin with. This is complex stuff, so please follow with me on this. And if you have any questions, just stop me so I can say it again. But there are parts of the Bible which talk about history ending in a, often a violent cataclysm. We speak about it as apocalyptic. Think about the book of Revelation, for example. History will end with some kind of destruction of this world and the birth of a new world. So the end of Jerusalem is the envisionment of a new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven. It's not a fulfillment of this one. It's an end of this world and a beginning of another one. We call that apocalyptic. 
There also is a strand within scripture, and this is what I like much better, uh, that we could call the fulfillment of history. Think about uh, the prophet Isaiah. The day will come when the lion lies down with the lamb, when children will not die young, when no one will plant and another one will reap the harvest. Do you remember these passages? Am I making sense? So you've got some who argue in Bible that this world will end and a new one has to be born. Others will argue that this world will be fulfilled in terms of God's purposes. Among those who think that history will end in some dramatic way, there are those who think that it will happen immediately and those who think that it will be delayed. The early Christians, for the most part, thought that history would end in their lifetime, that God would end this history and Jesus would return in some kind of power and glory. Others thought that this isn't happening now, it will be delayed until some future. Luke thinks that history will end, but it's going to be delayed because he is living at a time when after the first generation and Jesus hasn't come back. Am I making sense? Three things that Luke believes as I read him. Number one, he says that history will, the end of history will come, but don't ask when, because that's in God's hands. So first thing, history will end at some point. It's up to God. Number two, the early Christians thought they were living at the end of times, and there were lots of signs that they pointed to, to the end of times. For example, they were living at the time of Nero, the emperor in Rome, who used Christians as human torches and crucified thousands. They were living at a time of the great eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii, this happened in the year 79, and it was so massive that it altered the climate of the Mediterranean basin for an entire year. Imagine how that felt to the ancient people. This is the end of the world. You, you hear the thoughts. And the biggest reason they thought that the world might be coming to an end is that Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed this great temple in which Jesus had prayed and preached. It's unthinkable to the early Jews that this could be destroyed and the Romans tore it apart brick by brick. Imagine you're living in that time. They think end of history has come. By the way, you hear lots of that talk even in the modern world. Throughout the 19th century, we had people saying the end of history has come. In our own time, you hear people proclaiming this. Luke knows about all of those events that I just named, but he's looking back on them. This is very important. He's writing in the 80s, maybe even in the early 90s. So he says all of these events are terrible, but they are historical, not apocalyptic. Hmm. I hope I'm making sense. He's saying this isn't the end of the world. These are terrible things, but they happen in history. And he's looking still toward the, the future. And then finally, for Luke, this delay does not mean that Christians should be complacent. This is the third thing he believes. So that even though the end of history is going to come in the future, be Ill alert now because you don't know when it's gonna happen. So carry out the mission of the church in the meantime, and that's what the book of Acts is all about. Questions on this? Is this helpful? Just kind of a schema of what I think Luke is doing. Now what I wanna do is go through it verse by verse and you can see this. So look first at 21, five and six, and I'll just read these and take a look at them. So. Chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. And the reason I'm spending some time on this, imagine Tessa would do the same, would feel the same. This is material that people often get tripped up on. It's, it's just 
what are we to make of all this? So let me tell you how Luke is thinking. Look at five and six. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. Luke puts these words in the mouth of Jesus, and for all we know, he did predict the destruction of the temple. He might have, I don't know. But Luke puts those words in his mouth because Luke knows it's already happened. You see how the gospel writers work. Did Jesus predict it? Yeah, he might have. But indeed, it happened. And so Luke makes sure that we see it in the gospel. Look over at 21 verses 20 to 24. With me here, 20 to 24. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those inside the city must leave it, and those out in the country must not enter it. For these are days of vengeance as a fulfillment of all that is written. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will come great distress on the earth and wrath against the people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be taken away as captives among all the nations. Well, yes, indeed that happened. And Luke thinks it's a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So that's what he says here. The fulfillment of all that is written. Because Isaiah and Jeremiah had also talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. And so Luke is saying, in fact, Jerusalem will be destroyed, and it's in fulfillment of the, of the prophecies. And Luke, and Luke knows that this has already happened. Did we lose some people here? We lost somebody on the screen. By the way, um, uh, the horror of the Roman conquest cannot be overstated. The ones who were told to flee the city, many of them fled swallowing their gold because they thought if they could smuggle it out of the city by swallowing their gold, they then would be able to defecate it out later on and have their wealth back. Well, somebody, um, they found this out some way or other. And so the Romans, whenever anybody left the city would just as uh, automatically cut them open to see if there was any gold inside. That's how awful it was. Can't begin to describe the horror of this. All of that is on the people's minds as they're reading Luke. Look back now at uh, 21, seven to eight. They asked him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. That's pretty clear. People will come with signs saying the end is near. Don't fall for it, says Luke. You don't know now when that will be. Look at the uh, next events, the next uh, verses. Then you hear of wars and insurrections. Do not be terrified. These things must take place first. Now look at the next. But the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and various places, famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But the end will not follow immediately. So be prepared. There will be terrible events. That does not mean the end of the world. Michael, we've had one uh, a minister, an uh, infamous minister that did, had that whole thing go on. It was from uh, the San Francisco area. Yeah. And yeah. we, we fall... The people followed him, well, right to where they did. So it's not, you know, we're not the only group that's done that. 
Absolutely not, Bob. It's a great point. Jim Jones is only one example of the many who have proclaimed to know the signs. Now watch what Luke says about that in a second, because he, he gets onto that as well. Uh, the next verses, by the way, 12 to 19, um, kind of summarized in the first line, but before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. So be prepared, because in this time, before the end of the history, uh, things will not always be easy for the followers of Christ. So he's warning now about that. We live in this in-between time, <clears throat> and you can expect persecution. But eventually, the day will come, and there will be signs for everyone to see. So look at verse 25. <clears throat> There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. So you see, again, he thinks the apocalyptic end of history will come, and you will know it when it gets here. It won't take any special insight, because the time will be evident to everyone. So don't be misled by wars and rumors of wars in the present, because this time will come and you will know it. And when Jesus returns, this is, I think, very important. It will be the same Jesus that you knew. That is the Jesus of love and compassion and so on who brings redemption. It's not that Jesus is coming back with a sword to wreak vengeance upon a sinful world. No, the same Jesus you knew is the one who's coming back. Luke believes this. Now comes a line that throws scholars off all the time. And this is an example also of how Gospels are written. Look at 21, verse 32. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place, which undercuts everything that I've just been saying. Now, what most scholars think, given the whole context of the chapter, is that these verses around this, like from 29 through 33, are taken as a whole out of the mark. And so, and so Luke simply takes a whole chunk out of Mark and puts it into his gospel, including Mark's thought that the world was going to end in this generation. But not if I'm making sense. Mark is writing at an earlier period. He thinks that these people alive now may not die before Jesus returns. Luke already is living another generation later. He knows that didn't happen. But Luke takes over this whole part from Mark and puts it in. And then read finally verses 34 to 36. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and stand before the Son of Man. This helpful? This is, this is tricky and difficult stuff, uh, but I try to go through it to show what I think Luke is thinking all the way through. Kathy? It, it doesn't seem consistent that Luke would be so careless as to leave the last sentence of the passage from Mark in there if Luke is the one who put it in there. I think that either it was added by later copyists inadvertently or deliberately, or when he says, all these things will come to pass. He means the wars and all of that and not the end of the world part, but that all of these bad things are going to happen and it's still not the end of the world. 
you could be a, a Bible commentator because that first one is one of the theories that's often advanced is that somebody later just put this in because it fit with the passage uh, as it, you found it in other gospels, nicely said. And the other one is also a theory that could well be true also that uh, is really talking about all these other things will come to pass. But, uh, but however, the, it's stuck in there. It feels a little awkward at the moment, uh, that one verse. But otherwise, you can see his argument. History will end. You don't know when it will be. Signs such as the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, as awful as they are, are events that happen in history. They do not signal the end of the world. Before the end of the world comes, you can expect persecution. That's the way of the followers of Christ. But when the time comes, Christ will return in glory, and it will be the same Jesus you knew. And be alert for that, because you don't know the day. The world needs more alerts. Be alert. Be alert. Alerts. That's right. It needs alerts. Comments on this? Did I ever tell you I like this stuff? Luke is a is a, is a, is a a theologian. He's thinking about our faith in relation to his scripture he's received. He knows that the the first generation passed away and Jesus didn't come. So what does that mean for us? And he is rethinking the Christian faith in this generation. You know how hard it is to do that. How about writing theology today in the face of pandemic? What are the signs of the times now? You hear how he's wrestling with all of this just as we do in our own times. What does it mean to live faithfully in this moment? That's what he's asking. Thanks. Nice to be with you. So next week, no Bible study. And then the following two weeks, we will finish the Gospel of Luke with the great passion story there, verse, uh, chapters 22 to 24. See you later. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody.